Greetings, Embers. Welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and enjoy this dose of vocal melatonin entitled Goodbye 2003 Part 2. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, I'll read the second story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. This happened when I was seven years old. I'm sharing because my older brother reminded me of it. Now that I'm 24 and now I can't get it out of my head. This was very traumatic for me because after this event, a bunch of other things started to happen. This is how it started. Growing up and now I live in a haunted state and live five miles away from the most victorious haunted forest. My mom used to tell my brothers and I about what she would hear walking by the forest, the murders that happened, and about how she used to see puck wedgies. My elder brother, 11 at the time, let's call him D, and I, a seven-year-old female, were watching TV in the living room. It was dark outside. Must have been a new moon. If you were sitting on the couch and looked to your right, you would see the glass sliding door, which viewed the backyard. Mind you, it was an acre lawn, and tall trees lined the perimeter. I was tired and decided to get my ritual glass of milk before bed, when I stood up and saw what was glaring at me through the glass door. It was tall, taller than the fucking door. It was skinny in the torso, but its chest was broad. It was white, with tall ears. I want to say it looked like the white version of Donnie Darko. I was about 15 feet from the glass door. I froze. It didn't move. It just kept looking at me. It could not have been anyone else because we lived in the middle of the woods. I start calling my brother's name, but D wasn't answering me. I started to get louder, now calling for my mom. Her room was on the other side of the couch, so she was there in a heartbeat. She looked at the back door, looked at D, then told me, to just sit back down. I couldn't understand why I was the only one freaking the fuck out. I laid on the couch facing away from the glass door. D puts a blanket on me and we both fell asleep on the couch. Well, 2021, D calls me from jail. He's been in and out since I was 13. This is how the conversation went. D, hey, can I ask you a question? Me. What's up? Do you remember that night? What night? The night where you were freaking out when we were young. Remember that tall, scary-looking shit that was at the back door? Right then and there, I had a flashback of that night. Look, I had a dream about it last night, and I wanted to tell you that I saw it too. I was too scared to do anything. Mom saw it also. The combo ended because... He only had so much time on the phone. I felt relief that I knew I wasn't just having a schizophrenic hallucination episode. But my body went numb from the memory of being so scared. I told my significant other about it. He's my best friend. My significant other told me that I came face to face with a Wendigo and how he wasn't surprised because of the small country town I lived in. When I looked up what a Wendigo was, my heart sank. That's exactly what I saw. Now, I think about it every damn day. It's been a year since I was reminded of it. I believe it still follows me. I feel like this is pretty much mild in comparison to a lot of stuff I've read on here, but this shit was spooky, and I think about it a lot. So, here goes. In 2017, I was a junior in college, and my friends and I went to spring break at Myrtle Beach. Being broke and wanting to save money on flights, we decided we would drive there from our school in New Hampshire as splitting the cost of gas would be way cheaper. So 
so we piled five of us into my friend's Hyundai hatchback and drove about 17 hours. We were almost there already, and we were driving through this little town. I will never forget it my entire life, called Fair Bluff, North Carolina. We got in there bright and early morning. First and foremost, the second we got in there, it was an absolutely morbid sight everywhere we looked. Just the year before, the town had been devastated by flooding in Hurricane Matthew. Broken down houses, all rotting from water damage, just apocalyptic, and everyone in the car agreed that the energy in this place was dreary. Despite this, we were driving slowly because we couldn't look away, so this memory plays in slow motion in my mind. Second, I am from New York and went to college in New Hampshire. So I was oblivious to the fact that North Carolina was home to vultures. So as we were driving slowly, we see a big old animal we couldn't quite make out being eaten by vultures. And then we came across like three more right on the side of the road. This definitely adds to the spook factor, but everyone was still composed. We keep driving and eventually drive by a hearse which sounds normal, but this hearse was pulled over on the side of the road. There was nothing around for a good two to three miles, but open fields and abandoned decaying houses, and two men were literally loading a casket into it. Just on the side of the road, no funeral home for miles. So we, of course, were questioning it, but ultimately just eager to get out of there at this point was our objective. The freakiness of it all came to a head when we drove by a literal cross burning. We drove by a cross that was pretty far out in a field, but it was so huge we could see it clearly. It must have been at least 10 foot tall, wooden, and it was scorched and partially burnt, still stuck on the ground. And at this point, we just high-tilted it out of there and were happy to see the welcome sign to the next town. We shook it off and proceeded to have a fun spring break. At the end, on the way back, however, it started to snow, and we were driving through Fair Bluff again. But this time it was pitch black. Not a single light except the headlights. The car was hydroplaning like crazy, and we were dangerously low on gas. We got out of there okay, but I felt genuine fear, both the first and even more the second time I drove through there, you will never catch me rolling through there again. Around 10 to 15 years ago, me and a friend driving down River Road when some winged creature swooped the hood of my car, surrounding and blocking both the windshield and wrapping around to the passenger and driver's side windows and then disappeared. I can provide more information about the location if someone has a similar experience. As we're driving, I'm telling her this story about this sleep paralysis demon I saw in a dream. It looks like a winged demon made of molten stone with red eyes trapped behind a stone prison that it escapes and chases me. It's dark out, maybe 9 to 10 p.m., and, as I'm telling this story as we drive under a large willow tree, something drops out of the sky, or the tree, and swoops the hood of my car, filling my entire windshield, wrapping around to my side windows with wings. My friend screams, and I stop the car. I remember it now as an owl with feathery wings, but part of me remembers red eyes, black fleshy wings and a human face, but I'm not sure if that's just because of what images were already running around in my head when it happened as I was telling the story. There are owls where we were, so I was wondering if maybe that's something owls do, swoop headlights or something, but there are no owls that would be large enough to explain what I saw. Just barn owls, and I've seen them before. I thought I'd ask around if anyone else has ever 
experience something like this, as it has always bothered me. And my friend is sick of me asking what she remembers. She just said it was weird and she was too scared and closed her eyes. Has anyone else had an owl or large bird swoop their car hood? Is there a cryptic matching this description or something that swoops cars? Anything would help. I'm willing to provide more information if it helps. Thank you for your time. So this story was some years ago. I was about 17 years old. It was super late. I honestly had no business being outside at that time. It was midsummer, so the night was cool and breezy. I was in downtown. I was leaving a friend's house because I fell asleep but didn't want to sleep over. I left her house and took the long way home. The shortcut would have been faster, but it was like 2 a.m.-ish. And the shortcut, including crossing the train tracks, where a train could or could not be on its way. And if there was a train coming, I would have to wait till it passed, amongst the rubble of abandoned factories. If that wasn't scary enough in the middle of the night, there's dangerous hobos or crackheads that sleep around there. I didn't want to fight for my life, so I figured I'd go around, getting on the street a few blocks from my place. The street was dead but well lit. The corner store I frequent was closed, so I knew I was out late because it was always open. I kept walking. I was like eight minutes away from home when I noticed the band just coasting behind me. And what I mean by coasting, they were driving as if they were looking for a parking spot on an empty street with nothing open. So I sped up. I passed the basketball court across the street from my house, the white van still coasting behind. I came to the stoplight to cross the street, looked both ways, then crossed. For my apartment was at the bottom of a hill and was behind a small corner store and behind the corner store was the driveway to my parents. Across the street was the police department. Straight up the hill was the college and the sidewalk had no light walking up. The only apartments were across from the dark sidewalk, but were gated and would mostly be no help in an emergency. So I get to the store and continue to walk the white van now catching up to me. My heart rate started to beat faster. I was thinking, oh my god, I'm gonna get kidnapped. As I took the turn to my driveway, the white van sped away. I ran down the driveway, took a sharp left to my back door with my keys in hand. As I turn the key, I can hear footsteps coming down the drive. I get in the house, lock the door, and stand in the kitchen in the still darkness, just waiting to see or hear if the steps would come up the back stairs. It was quiet, and the clicking noises the apartment made had me on edge. I waited for a while and heard no extra noises, so I settled in. The next day, my grandfather was upset that I came in past curfew. He gave me the longest speech about being out too late. How people in the 70s would steal women like me off the street and force them to be sex workers, sexually assault, or kill them. I told him he was right and I apologized and that I will never do it again. I never forgot that white van and the potential horrors that could have awaited me had I kept walking up the dark hill next to the college. I want to preface this by saying I'm not dismissing this as a part of her imagination developing. She is three, though and has never constructed a narrative before, and I'm not sure where this came from. Last night, she and her little brother were both scared to go into the loft or living room. It's an old house. It's over a 100 years old. I am currently trying to fix everything up. We moved into it about three to four months ago. She randomly said about two hours ago that there's a lady in the house. I laughed and asked her what the lady does. 
What followed an increasingly weird conversation where I asked simple, non-leading questions, and she gave the following info. The lady lives in the house, wears a green dress, and picks up her toys. She saw her in the window, picking up toys. She lives upstairs in the loft and attic area. She can't tell us her name because the lady will get mad. The lady is her friend. The lady does not like mom. I obviously instinctively thought there's a woman secretly living in our house because of all the stories. I took my German shepherd up there. I have noticed before by the way our cat refuses to go upstairs. My dog was fine and checked the place out. We really searched every nook and cranny and there is no evidence of entry or anyone being up there. My German Shep didn't seem bothered by anything up there, and she definitely didn't smell anyone. If someone was up there, they'd have a hard time getting her to like them. She's semi-aggressive with those outside the pack, and has mauled an intruder at our old house, so I don't think anyone is up there. So I'm open to ideas, and I'm not going to believe anything for certain, but I would like to hear ideas from the paranormal community on if there are things that have similar traits and trends that are relevant here. This story begins years ago when I was 16. I was part of an alternative school day program for youth with behavior problems or who had been out of school for years, like me. A few months into it, we had a new classmate called E. E was very strange from the beginning. He was very tall, severely underweight, glasses with a bad case of cystic acne. As the teacher introduced him to the class, I felt an awful gut feeling as his small beady eyes zeroed in on me. He immediately sat across from me while I was on the computer, stared at me with a creepy smile, and began grunting heavily while rubbing his legs for well over an hour. I determinedly tried to avoid eye contact and was convinced that E must suffer from a serious mental disorder. I later found out that E was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. Over the next few weeks, all of my classmates either avoided or ignored him, called him weird and creepy. I privately agreed, but felt a bit bad for him considering that he was probably unaware just how creepy he really was. I attempted to be friendly towards him as a gesture of kindness, making small talk and asking him about his day. For the next few months, we spoke to each other briefly in passing, but not more than that. By the start of the next school year, many of our old classmates had left, and we had new kids in our program. I became the only female in our class. He invited me to sit with him one day during lunch, and feeling awkward and unable to say no, I agreed. This turned out to be a huge mistake. He eagerly asked me to be friends with him. And I said yes out of sympathy. We exchanged numbers and discovered we had a few similar interests in music and movies. He wanted to become a filmmaker and was obsessed with cinema. The next year turned into a nightmare. I began receiving constant texts from E every few hours, then progressing to every half hour. If I didn't respond within the next minute, I would be barraged with angry texts asking me why I was ignoring him. He became very angry every time I would talk about other friends or speak to someone else in our class. He verbally attacked every single one of our classmates to me in detail, insulting their appearance, intelligence, race, etc. I grew more and more disgusted with him and attempted to disengage myself from him but the more I pulled away, the tighter he would hold on. I was also very beta and a huge doormat at the time, dealing with low self-esteem. I had no idea how to stand up for myself. Then, one day, he dropped a bombshell on me, and one of our other classmates, 
who E was on good terms with. E told us that he had been expelled from his high school because he had threatened someone. We asked for more details and he told us he had been in love with his eighth grade teacher for years and he found her on Facebook and realized that she was engaged. He began messaging her, professing his love for her, and she repeatedly asked him not to message her and ended up blocking him. He created a new account posing as her fiance and added all of her friends and attempted to add her. He was quickly discovered and was again warned to stay away from her. While in the 10th grade sitting in class, he messaged her again and threatened to kill her and her fiance and bomb his school if she didn't respond. He said that within minutes, about 8 to 10 police cars had shown up outside the school and hauled him out, and he ended up institutionalized. Needlessly to say, when he told me all of this, I was horrified. To make matters worse, he also said that he was forced to attend hypnotherapy to cure his bad thoughts. I asked him to elaborate and he told me that he oftentimes fantasized sexually about kids and wanted to hurt them. I was shocked, to say the least. I realized that this guy was violent and potentially extremely dangerous, and I needed to stay away from him. I attempted again to disengage myself from him, and even ended up leaving the program several months later, partly to avoid him. It was incredibly stressful having to see him nearly every single day in class, where he would obsessively follow me around, attempting conversations with me. What was worse? I began to have an inkling that E was developing a crush on me based on his obsessive behavior. I felt afraid, hopeless, disgusted, and wanted to get as far away from him as possible. When I finally left, I felt relieved, as though a huge dead weight was lifted off my chest, and I could finally breathe again. E had begun to feel like a noose, slowly tightening around my neck preventing me from living my life. When I left, E was devastated and angry, asking why I was leaving him. I began ignoring his messages, which increased every 10 to 15 minutes, sometimes in the middle of the night. He threatened suicide if I wouldn't speak to him, and I felt afraid, and as though I had no one to tell or turn to, I felt obligated to speak to him. E became progressively creepier, asking me if I could give him a pair of my old high heels, and when I refused, he became angry. He began demanding the names of all of my other friends and whether or not I had a boyfriend. I repeatedly lied to get him to stay away and claimed I was in a relationship, even though I wasn't. He would tell me how much he hated our classmates and wanted to bomb and shoot up our school. I didn't take him seriously, I know, that's very stupid of me, and believed at the time that he was just saying these things for shock value, and also because E had a very dark sense of humor. I eventually lost my temper sometime around Christmas and told him in no uncertain terms that he was not allowed to message me ever again. He blew up at me, insulting me, sending me all kinds of videos including sexual assault and murder scenes from his favorite movies. He then began telling me that he was in love with me and that his feelings for his old teacher had transferred onto me. He said that he knew where I lived. Feeling dread, I played along and laughingly told him that he was lying and to tell me my address. He proceeded to write my full address, postal code included, into the text. He then said... Maybe I'll come pay you a little visit. He gave me the full name and Facebook link of my younger brother, who was a minor at the time, which he knew, and said, I bet your little brother is hot. I was equally furious and terrified that he would threaten me and my family or think about showing up to where I lived. I began dreading him showing up at my doorstep. I barely slept for the next month, 
repeatedly having nightmares about him attacking one of us. I called my phone provider and asked them to block his number, since I couldn't do it manually. The call rep misunderstood me, and instead of blocking his number, he forwarded all of my calls to E's number. I was unaware for the next month or two. He quickly was able to get my sister's phone number, my cousin's numbers, and anyone else who knew me. He began obsessively calling my sister, asking for information about me. I called back the phone provider and they rectified the mistake, but the damage had already been done. I woke up one morning and furious that I had to live in fear from this rat. I sent E a long message warning him that if he contacted me again, I would call the police on him and he would end up being institutionalized once more. He stopped contacting me after that and I finally felt free. Three years later, I made a post on Reddit saying that I felt depressed and someone in the comments messaged me offering me advice, saying that they cared about me and could help me. He asked if he could message me sometime. I said yes, message me anytime. The next night, I got a phone call from an unrecognized number. I picked up and a man was hyperventilating and crying into the phone, saying, I'm sorry, repeatedly, saying he called the wrong number by mistake and asked if I hated him. I was freaked out and asked him if he needed an ambulance. He said, no, no, I, I just need you to talk to me. It sounds stupid now, but I didn't think that this person was E. I thought for sure it was a wrong number. I just stayed on the line while he calmed down, trying to get him to relax, repeatedly telling him it's okay. He thanked me and eventually got off the phone. The next day I got a text from the number thanking me for yesterday and he felt ashamed. I told him it was no problem and nothing to be embarrassed about. He asked me if he could text me some time and I told him yes. He then said, my name is E, by the way. What's yours? I felt myself fall back into the old nightmare, but tried to convince myself that it was a coincidence. I asked him for his last name, and he confirmed that it was the same last name. I then messaged him the same thing I told him before, not to contact me and to stay away from me or I would call the police and get them involved. He didn't message me again after that. That same day, someone had deleted the Reddit account that had messaged me. I did get a few creepy texts over the next year from random numbers, obviously fake. Things like, hey, are you the guy who threw the pool party at your house? Where do you live? What's your name? I just want to know if you're the same person. Sometimes I would get phone calls with someone breathing heavily into the phone. I did eventually get a new number which put a stop to all of this, thankfully. The next time I would see E was several years later. I was at a library, far from where I live at night, checking out a book near closing time. I turned around as someone opened the door and saw a huge, hulking man wearing a trench coat and a fedora. Not even kidding about this. With a scruffy beard, glaring at me with such ferocity, He'd gain even more weight than the last time I'd seen him. His hands curled into fists. He didn't attempt to check out any books. Just stood there glaring at me with the ferocity of a thousand neckbeards. An awful stench emanated from him, and he stood, eyes narrowed, turning to watch me as I left. I gave him no indication that I had recognized him, but I felt growing dread in my chest. I felt this awful feeling that he was planning something horrible, like he wanted to hurt me. When I'd left, he also left and creepily followed for several blocks, walking quickly and continuing to glare at me. I managed to get away from him, thankfully, and turned into a crowded street. Out of curiosity, a year ago, I looked E up and found him on social media. He now has a pseudonym which he refers to as his alter ego. 
He has a profile on a site that you can upload videos on too. He calls them his short films. In every single one of them, he's carrying a knife around, wearing a mask, and is chasing his cat around, pretending to stab it. In another, he has fake blood splattered around and is wielding a knife while grinning creepily at the camera. Over the past two years, I've sporadically seen E at places very close to where I live, at the library or near the market. Each time, he stops and stares at me when I walk by. It's very unnerving. I've had people message me on a game I used to play a lot, sending me insults, the same things E had written. Today, I went on my LinkedIn profile I use a fake name so people like E can't find me, which has a feature called People Also Viewed. It shows the people who viewed your profile have also viewed these other profiles. All of them were filmmakers in our city. One of them was for a private investigator who is also based in my city. I refuse to believe that this is a coincidence. I think E found me on LinkedIn viewed my profile in private mode, and also viewed the profiles of those other people. I'm wondering if E has already or is planning on hiring a private investigator to gather more information about me. Okay, let me start off by saying that I'm not a street smart person or I wasn't back several years ago when this occurred. I've always been pretty naive and trusting, sadly, which has landed me in some pretty crappy situations. But this one was by far the scariest. So I had just recently gone through a really, really shitty, bitter, horrible breakup with my boyfriend and found myself living alone after he packed his bags and left. I didn't really know many people in the area and so tended to turn to the internet to pass the time. Long story short, I started chatting to a guy, let's call him John, and we started hitting it off and it turned out he lived really near me. By really near me, I mean like half hour walk away. So we decide to meet up the next day and see how it went. I phoned my friend, let's call her Anne. Anne is infinitely wiser and more cynical than I am, and told her what the plan was. She insisted she come with me, as I don't know this guy. He could be an axe murderer, blah, blah, blah. So the next day, Anne and I meet up with John at around lunchtime in a local pub. It was midsummer, so we sat outside in the beer garden. It was pretty busy despite it being lunchtime, and this place was right next to a busy road, so there was nothing to worry about, right? Well, we got some food and a beer. We were all chatting, and it's going pretty well. We were all hitting it off and having a laugh. We are taking turns to go to the bar to get around. I don't know if this is the term outside of England where one person buys drinks for the whole group, then later the next person goes and does the same, so on and so on. So the day is turning into the afternoon, which is turning into evening. The pub is filling up and we barely notice the time going by as we are all having a good time. We are filled with five or six beers by this time. So we are pretty tipsy too. So John goes to the bar to get his round in. And the next thing I know, I'm waking up the next morning in my own bed. My face is hurting and there is blood all over my sheet. I started freaking out at this point because I have literally no recollection of what the hell happened between 8 p.m. and waking up the next day. I don't know where the blood has come from and I don't know why I'm hurting. So tentatively, I get up and take a look in the mirror. Now, my face is an absolute mess. I look like I've been in a fight and lost badly. I have a black eye, split lip. Half of my face is just scraped and bruised. I feel sick. I was totally gobsmacked. What the hell happened to me? So I open my bedroom door to go to the bathroom when I see out of the corner of my eye, John laying naked on my sofa. 
Now at this point, I'm just losing my mind and start yelling at him like crazy, demanding he tell me what the fuck was going on. He eventually calms me down and explains to me that I got out of mind wasted the night before and I was embarrassing myself, slurring and stumbling all over the place. And eventually, I fell over a picnic bench and hit my head pretty hard. Apparently, I was bleeding and refusing help from anyone, so he called a cab and brought me home, like the absolute knight in shining armor that he is. I didn't remember any of this, not one single moment. I had a million questions, but at the same time, I was utterly speechless. I know I had a few to drink, but it was no more than an average person would consume at a night out in a club, and I had had many of those. Was it possible that I just had that one too many? Hmm, I guess so. What other explanation was there? I just looked at John with my mouth open, head absolutely pounding, and eventually managed to muster, I'm going to be sick. So John looked after me that morning. He peppered the day with the odd tale of dumb things I'd done the night before and how I must be so grateful because anything could have happened to me and I never would have got back without him. I ate and got dressed and by that afternoon I was feeling better. So he said he wanted to take me to his house and make me dinner so we could resume our date. You know, from the point where I'd ruined it by getting blackout drunk. So I said, yeah, sure. It was nice of him to still want to hang out after everything. Like I said, I'm a naive twat. I really don't have much situational awareness at all. So we get to his house late in the afternoon. But when I say house, he lived in a static caravan. In a caravan park. I mean, it was nice enough inside, but... I couldn't help but get a creepy vibe from it. It was tiny. The layout was you open the front door into the living room. Then further in, you have the kitchen and the dining area. Then through a door into the tiny hall, you have two small bedrooms and the small bathroom. And then after that, there's a back door in the main bedroom. Now I'm sitting in the dining area while he's cooking and we are just generally making chit chat. I'm feeling pretty awkward now because I can still remember absolutely nothing of the night before. So it feels like there's already been a power shift. Like he knows more about me than I'm aware of and it's really uncomfortable. I decide I would eat his food then politely excuse myself home. I didn't know what I was thinking, coming here in the first place. I'm a pretty go-with-the-flow type of person, but even I had started thinking, what am I even doing here? Just then, he asks me how I'm feeling, and as I'm deep in thought, I don't even think about my reply. I feel like I've been drugged, I said distractedly. Well, at this point, he just flips the fuck out. I mean, he's just going insane, saying, what am I accusing him of, and how dare I accuse him of things, and I can't prove it, and I'm just trying to cause all sorts of problems for him, and he's on parole, so I'm basically sending him back to jail with my lies. I had no idea at all that he was on parole. He would later tell me in his insane rambling texting sessions that he was arrested for domestic assault. Great. He starts literally getting stuff off the kitchen sides and just smashing them. Throwing plates against the wall, pulled the toaster out of the socket and smashed that on the floor. Just absolutely having a meltdown whilst I'm sitting at this tiny caravan dining table, like five feet away just thinking, what the fuck is even happening right now? I moved to stand up and tell him I think I'd better go when he suddenly lunges at me and shoves me as hard as he can and I'm on my knees and he's laying blows into me telling me I'm not going anywhere. He's between me and the front door at this point and I can't see an escape route 
So I turn heel and just run through the corridor with him chasing just inches behind me. I dive into the nearest door and slam it shut and sit with my back to it so he can't get in. I'm in the tiny spare bedroom and there's no windows that opens. I'm trapped here. He's outside pounding at the door and calling me every vile cuss word in his vocabulary. I yell at him to go away and he stops banging. I hear him leave for a few moments, then all of a sudden, bump, bump, bump. He's trying to break down the door. I am absolutely terrified at this point and pushing with all of my weight back against the door as if my life depended on it, which I guess I did, really. The thumping carries on for what seemed like forever. Then I guess he got tired or something, and I heard him go into the living room and start shuffling around. I still stayed backed against that door, sobbing for at least another hour. Eventually, I hear the TV come on. He's actually sitting, chilling, watching some TV, like nothing whilst he's basically got a hostage cowering in his spare bedroom. I felt a flick of anger and adrenaline at this point, and I ever so slowly and quietly open the door and peer out. The hall is in darkness, and the door to the living room is shut. I'm alone, but I'd have to walk past him to get to the front door. I'm desperately thinking of a way I can get out when I remember the back door. I creep over to it as silently as I could and prayed that it was unlocked. It was. I silently thanked every single god I could think of and crept out, shutting the door silently behind me. I crept down the stairs and then just ran. Just ran and ran, sobbing and delirious and so fucking utterly confused. I had no idea where I was. It was pitch dark and I'd never been to this part of town before. I ran to the nearest payphone and used the change in my pocket to call my friend to come and pick me up. My bag and purse were still in John's caravan, along with some other personal possessions I just abandoned. My friend drove me home and I sobbed the whole way home. I never told him what had happened and he never asked. I just got home and went to bed and cried myself to sleep. The next morning, I wake up and find my phone that I've left at home. It has about 50 text messages on it, mostly from John, telling me he's going to patrol bomb my house and kill my family, and if he ever saw me in the street, he would stab me to death, and he'd happily go to jail if it meant I was dead. I deleted them all. I was scared out of my mind. I just wanted it to be all over and to forget about him. I never really told anybody what happened, not to the full extent anyway. As the days went by, I would get crazy rambling texts from him, one moment threatening to kill me and the next moment telling me he loves me and he's sorry. I delete every single one as soon as I received it. They gradually got less frequent and I changed my number not long after and didn't hear from him again. I got in contact with Ann a while later. Turns out she has no memory from about 8 p.m. that night, and her boyfriend had an incoherent voice message from her just babbling and screaming and crying. He picked her up, wandering bewildered on the nearby house estate. I know we should have gone to the police. I know I should have told somebody. I know there's a million things I could have done, but I just wanted it to be over. It was the surrealist thing that I have ever been through, and I still sometimes think back to it and wonder if it really happened, because it was just so insane. So, crazy psycho online date guy, let's never ever meet again. I used to do DoorDash on the side for extra cash. This was in summer of 2018, when it was a little bit newer. 
At least in my town, it was. Since then, I think they've made a lot of changes, but at the time, it was a little unorganized. If you don't know what DoorDash is, it's like a food delivery service typically for restaurants that don't deliver. Think about McDonald's or etc. Anyways, the one night I was doing deliveries all day, I decided to do my last delivery at around 10 p.m. So I get an order in and the person wants a medium cheese and pepperoni pizza and loaded potato wedges from a pizzeria nearby. I was kind of wondering why they'd order a pizza from a pizzeria that delivers and I figured it's because this place was notorious for taking forever when you order for delivery. I accepted the order and headed to the pizzeria. I got there and picked up the pizza, confirmed on the app that I had picked everything up and was on my way. The app notified me of the special instructions that the customer asked for, which was to call him when I was outside. Okay, nothing unusual there. Lots of people ask so they can come out to me. I get to their address and it's downtown. It's a larger apartment building and it's completely pitch black and I instantly get an eerie feeling. So I pull to the curb, stay in the car, hell no I wasn't about to go near that building, and call the number. Luckily, DoorDash has this thing that hides your actual phone number. It rings a couple of times, and then this really creepy woman's voice comes on the line and says, we can't get to the phone right now, we're a little tied up and then creepily giggles. Meanwhile, the entire time in the background, there was another woman screaming. And I do mean screaming for help and for her life. It got even louder as if the creepy woman was purposely putting the screaming woman on the phone. I instantly hung up and drove off really quick, not even knowing which direction to go. Luckily, there was a super popular restaurant a couple blocks away, and I pulled into that parking lot and pulled up the app. I was worried about getting in trouble for not being able to deliver the order, so I contacted DoorDash Help Center, and they told me I had to wait 15 minutes to see if they'd call or message me about their food. Well, they never called, and thank God for that. I'm sitting here in the parking lot of this restaurant telling my mom about it, and we agree that it is probably a prank, but that just in case it isn't, I need to call the police. So I called the non-emergency number and tell them everything. The police tell me they're going to do a wellness check and actually thank me for calling them to tell them about it. I went home and nothing ever came of it. But I do still think about it from time to time. I did get a free pizza and potato wedges, though, so that was cool. Creepy lady in the apartment, let's not meet. And to the lady screaming, I hope you're safe and okay. I used to live in a three-story house with my parents younger sibling, and our dog. We moved into this house a few months before my younger sibling was born. And that was when we first met the neighbors across the street. Lucas, who was the oldest child in their family, was always a bit strange. But there were some aspects of his personality that were more than just strange. They were straight up disturbing. It would take hours to cover everything, so I'm just going to get straight to the point. I'm almost positive that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. Our house was built on a hill, so it looked like it was only two stories from the front, and the basement was connected to the backyard. The yards in this neighborhood were much larger than they are in the newer housing developments, so it would have been very easy for someone to enter our backyard unnoticed. Despite this, the family was terrible about making sure all of the basement doors were locked. My younger sibling and I would always go in and out when we were playing in the backyard, or someone would go down to let the dog out, and we would end up forgetting to lock one of the doors before bed. 
We also lived in a safe area where it was common for people to leave their doors unlocked. However, my father did always lock the door leading down to the basement every night, along with all of the other doors on the main level of the house. I had a fucked up sleep schedule back then, so I would usually still be awake at 3 or 4 in the morning. There are two specific instances that happen very late at night, which make me think that Lucas has been inside of our house without our knowledge. One night, I was in my bedroom on the upper level of the house. It was probably around 2.30 in the morning when I suddenly heard the sound of an angry growl coming from downstairs. Thinking that my dog had spotted a cat in the front yard, I quickly rushed downstairs to stop him from barking and waking up my entire family. This kind of thing would happen every now and then, so I wasn't thinking too much of it at the time. But instead of going downstairs and finding my dog by the front window, I found him by the locked door that leads down into the basement. The fur on the back of his neck was standing up and his nose was pressed to the bottom of the door. I instantly froze when I realized what was happening. There was something or someone on the other side of the basement door. I was barely a teenager at the time, so I began to panic and started making my way upstairs as quietly as possible. I woke up both of my parents and neither of them took me very seriously. My dad just assumed that my dog was hearing random noises coming from outside. But he did eventually go down to check things out. He said that everything downstairs looked normal, but he also mentioned that we forgot to lock one of the basement doors that night. Then there was another time that I was up late and in my room. But this time, instead of hearing my dog growling, I heard a loud bark that echoed throughout the entire house. The sound was sudden and intense, similar to a gunshot and it almost made me jump out of my chair. Assuming again that my dog had seen a cat outside, I quickly looked out of my bedroom window and tried to spot whatever he was barking at. But my heart suddenly dropped when, instead of seeing a cat, I saw Lucas running out of our front yard in the pitch black. I watched him run across the street and back towards his own house. Before I rushed to close the curtains and duck out of sight, I remember sitting there struggling to process what I had just seen and questioning why Lucas would be in our yard in the middle of the night. I told my mom about it the very next morning, and she said that she would bring it up to Lucas's mom. Because of these two instances and because of other details that I can't include, I'm 99% sure that Lucas has been inside of our house in the middle of the night. If you knew the entire story behind this family, then you would also find the thought of this to be extremely disturbing. I do want to mention that this all happened years ago. My family no longer lives in that house, and those neighbors across the street are doing fine. But looking back on everything now, I'm realizing just how creepy the situation truly was. It was dark, a mile or so from the river, lots of woods. We were driving, no cars coming or anything. Night, like after 10, and not near a town. Right on the edge of our headlights, I saw something run across the road, super fast. So fast, I almost thought it was a glare on my glasses. I didn't say anything at first because my husband does not believe in paranormal stuff. Bigfoot, nothing like that. I happened to look over, and he had a weird look on his face. I asked if he had just seen something. He said, yup. I said, something really tall and thin? He said, yep. Now, this next part, I was afraid to say because I thought he would think I was going crazy, but I said it anyway. I asked if it looked like a very tall stick, like a thin tree or a stick from a tree, 
with arms and legs. And he said yes. It really bothered both of us. I've never seen anything like it and didn't even know it was a thing until I started to Google it. I've seen ghosts and things, but nothing like this. This thing was so fast, if you blinked, it was gone. And when I say tall, like 10 feet, maybe more. We saw it just for a second in our headlights. I saw it take maybe two steps before we passed it. Arms swinging, very, very thin. It looked like a twig with arms and legs. If my husband hadn't seen it too, I would have never believed I had actually seen it. I know people will doubt it happened, but I know we saw something. Small chance on the cause of one ranger story from about a decade or so ago. I was hunting public land with my dad, several miles from anything close to a trail. So the day goes by and not much is going on. Weather is shitty and I'm not hearing distant gunshots. So I reckon the deer aren't moving much. I radio to the old man that I'm going to head back and we make plans to rendezvous where we had split up that morning. 20 or so minutes later, I was kneeling around the edge of a pond, stripping off all my bulky camo layers. I was just fucking around putting stuff in my bags while I listened to my earphones. I can't remember if I had taken my blaze orange hat off or not to remove my pullover, but I had all the appropriate gear to denote myself as a hunter in my possession. As I was digging through my bag, I thought I heard the faint bass of someone yelling. So I took an earbud out and noticed that crouched on the opposite side of the pond, there was a lone forest ranger kind of just watching me. I stood up but didn't wave, and I wasn't sure he had even yelled to me in the first place, so I didn't holler anything to him. We just kind of locked eyes for what felt like a few minutes. To be clear, we weren't doing anything illegal. My rifle was unloaded by that point, though slung over my shoulder, obscuring the fact the action was open and were following all laws and regulations. I hunched back over to my bag, pulled out my walkie and radioed to my dad. We've got company. My motives weren't nefarious. I just didn't want my dad to come bumbling down the hill and be surprised by a friendly law enforcement officer. When I looked back up, maybe 15 seconds later, the ranger was gone. I mean, flat the fuck out gone. So eventually, I meet back up with my dad and start to tell him about what happened. Yeah, as deep back in here as we are, he probably thought we were up to no good and hit the trail when he saw you on a the radio. They get ambushed like this. As someone who gets nervous, anxious, around cops, it never occurred to me that I could be causing similar anxiety in them. If you're reading this, DNR, bro, I'd like to offer you a heartfelt my bad and keep up the good work. Let me start off by saying that English is not my first language, so if any of this is confusing, please forgive me. So, a few days ago, I ordered a delivery service via an app called Rappi that works in South America. That's where I live. And to be able to get the delivery, you obviously have to give details like your cell phone number and your house address. When I received the delivery, the guy started flirting with me and asking me weird stuff. I told him I am only 16, hoping that he would then leave me alone but he just tried to keep making conversation. But I just told him to have a good day and closed the door. Flash forward to yesterday in the afternoon. Someone called my house's phone number. Keep in mind that I didn't give out that information in the app. 
My mom picked up the phone, and the man told her he wanted to talk to me, calling me by my name. She asked who he was, and he told her he was one of my school friends. My mom gave me the phone, and the man told me who he was, gave me his name, which later turned out to be a made-up name, and said I was very hot and that he wanted me to meet up with him. I immediately hung up on him. I started looking in the Rappi app to see if there's a way to denounce this guy, but I couldn't find anything. Then, I tried to search in the delivery history and didn't find anyone with the name he told me. I'm really creeped out right now because I don't know how he found out my house's phone number, and he also knows where I live. Hopefully, he never tries to reach out to me again. This was last summer, so around a year ago. I was in rehab and decided to make a Ouija board, and me and my three roommates there had all agreed we would try it out. We were all very skeptical, mostly leaning towards the side of disbelief, but still open. It was a full moon that night. We started by holding hands in a circle around the board and saying that we were open to any spirits willing to talk. And... I guess just putting that energy out there. Then we took the planchette and moved it around the board in circles a couple of times. We are in rehab with no access to the internet, so kind of just doing what we felt was right, not sure on proper procedure. When we were all moving it, our hands were heavy on the board, and you could feel it being dragged. I will admit, I tried moving it on my own as well in the beginning to just mess with my friends, but again, the planchette feels like it's being dragged. Then I stopped and began to take it seriously. And when it was actually moving, it's hard to explain, but there was an entirely different energy to it. It glides across the board like butter. The board and planchette were made from cardboard. We were all so freaked out. Sometimes a couple of us would take our hands off or we'd tell another girl to move her hand and it would still keep moving. It spells one of the girl's names. We'll call her Sally. Her name is a very unusual name. We asked who was contacting us. It said sister. Sally had a little sister that died under her care when they were very little. Sally, of course, is scared. She asks, what is your name? It spells F-L-O-R. I'm thinking maybe it's trying to say Florida, but stopped. But at this point, Sally is shaking and in tears. Her sister's name was Floor. None of us knew that. After that, I think we contacted another spirit that said it was a female and had been shot, and maybe another one that I cannot recall. It's crazy because the energies felt different, like how it glides across the board. So now we're all total believers. It's maybe the next night or two nights after. Me and one of my roommates decided to play. I think we contacted a spirit similar to the one from last time, when all of a sudden, the vibes completely change. It spells out my name. I'm like, oh, no. And my name is also super unique as well. And even though I believe in this now, that's the last thing I wanted to happen, was something to address me directly. The planchette starts zooming back and forth, back and forth, so fast. It was going to AZ, 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 over and over, basically flying out of our hands almost. We're kind of scared, and no matter what we ask it, it keeps repeating the same letters, A and Z, over and over. So we get super spooked and stop playing. The next night, we decided to try again. It starts like usual, putting forth our intentions, doing circles, and asking how many spirits were with us. My name was spelled again. I asked who it was. It said, Father. My friend asked me if my dad was dead, and I said, No, what the fuck? We asked what it wanted, and dude, it spelled out painful, then went back to doing the AZ, AZ, AZ thing. Decided it wasn't going anywhere, so we said goodbye and put it away. 
We tried one more night, but it was the same spirit messing with us with the same letters over and over, so we didn't do it again. That whole experience was so insane to me. I kept a journal of all of this when it happened, so if I went and looked, I could give all the exacts. I was a parks officer for a downtown metropolitan out in the Pacific Northwest. I saw my fair share of weird stuff on my 1700 to 0100 shift. Naked bike ride after party at midnight with about a thousand or so naked people chilling out. The occasional couple having sex, homeless person masturbating or shooting up heroin, and the occasional dead body were all a normal part of the job. Anyways. This one night, we were sent to investigate a tent set up relatively near the waterfront, which was generally a homeless person that was trying to stay dry for the night. So we're there at around 23.30 and tell the lady inside that she has to go a few hundred yards away to an area that isn't patrolled. She fusses and bitches about having to move, then mentioned a man living in a cave at the bottom of a shallow ravine nearby that's been killing small animals and eating them. We ask her for more information and she points to a general area about 50 yards away through some thick bush, the general area most people wouldn't wander past. My partner and I start to walk through the thick brush with just our flashlights and eventually stumble upon the ravine. And sure enough, there is a small opening on the side, enough for a person to fit in. I scale down about 20 feet and peek inside the opening and see what seems like a massive pile of magazines, torn pages, articles of clothing, a sugar cookie tin, a gorilla costume hand, some crude-looking tools including a makeshift bow, a few knives, and other general weird shit. Being curious and that the cave was empty. I opened the sugar cookie tin and found a large amount of what seemed like raw animal meat. At this point, I was thoroughly freaked the fuck out and decided to unass the area and inform the police of what I had found. We didn't carry weapons, by the way. We never found out what became of the guy who was staying there or what was going on there, but definitely freaky at around midnight in pitch black conditions. This was three years ago, and I started college down in the country. I was 18 and on Tinder. I never actually met anyone off of it, but I would just swipe through guys just to be nosy and see who was on it. I was swiping right on some, and about an hour after, got a message off this guy, who, according to his account, was about 20 kilometers away. We made some small talk. It was awkward, and I stopped replying. A day later, I got a friend request from him on Facebook. Mind you, I have a common enough name so it would have taken ages for him to have found me. We have no mutual friends and my Tinder photos is not on my Facebook page. The only thing I had on it was the university I was attending. So maybe that's how he found me, but I don't know. I then quickly got a follow request on Instagram and he somehow found my Snapchat username. I don't have it on my social media, and it is a variation of my full name with extra added in vowels and underscores. I was freaking out at this point. I messaged him asking how he found out my full name, and he just replied with, I think we have a connection. I really want to get to know you better. I immediately unmatched him, deleted my tender and blocked the account he tried to add me on on all social media. After that, it was quiet for a few months. I was staying in digs and was knuckling down as I had a lot of assignments from the get-go. This was toward the end of November. I had no assignments due for two weeks, so I decided to go out with some friends. One of my friends stayed in student accommodation and the other was commuting. 
so she was staying with the other friend. I decided to walk back to my digs, as my landlady would probably freak out if I wasn't home that morning, and I really wished I had gotten a taxi instead. My walk back was about 15 minutes from the local nightclub we were at. It was about 3 a.m. at this point. I was at the front door of the house opening up. The door was annoying as it had two different locks and I had to pull the handle towards myself to open it up. It's also tough when you're tipsy and trying not to wake up the family you're staying with. Anyway, as I finally unlock the door, a dark car pulls into the housing estate I'm staying in. It's quite big and has a big green area in the middle for children or people to play with their dogs. The car comes towards me, so I quickly get inside and lock the door. The car pulls into the driveway of the house I'm staying in and just sits there with their full headlights on high beam. I'm there shaking and too afraid to move from crouched below the door as there's frosted glass about halfway up. As I get the courage to go upstairs to look out of my bedroom window to see who it was, the car pulls out of the driveway and speeds off. A few days later, I get a new friend request off the creepy Tinder guy on a new Facebook profile as there were no photos on this account, just the same name. Blocked. It was enough that it caused me to transfer universities the following year. Thankfully, I haven't heard anything since. I don't know if it was just bad timing or if it was that creep on Tinder that sat in the driveway, but I was petrified. If you take anything from this, be careful who you let in on social media and dating apps, and especially what information you give out. I'm sorry if my grammar is a bit off. This is my first time writing this down, and I'm not exactly fluent in English. I had no interest in sharing this encounter, but a couple of my friends were convinced that this was interesting. At least one person out there. So, here you go. So, this happened almost exactly three years ago. I had just turned 15, and in Finland, where I live... Turning 15 is a big thing for teenagers, since when you turn 15, you can get a 50cc moped license, and these kind of bikes are a huge part of youth culture here. So, long story short, I had just got my license and was at a party at my friend's house. This friend of mine came from a wealthy family, and their family owned a huge plot of land, mostly full of inhabited forests and lakes. His house was pretty much in the middle of their land, and it was a very remote place surrounded by forest. The nearest village was over 30 kilometers, about 20 miles away. Although I lived pretty far away, I insisted on going by myself with my brand new moped since I was so excited of finally having one. My parents were, obviously, against this, but ultimately allowed me to drive there. The party lasted the entire day, and when it was around 2 a.m., I had to finally leave. Although their family is wealthy, the only road that connects my friend's house to the big main road is a long, badly kept, and narrow paved road surrounded by forest. It is unsettling as shit, especially at night. It should have been illuminated properly, but at the time, pretty much every single street lamp was either broken or tipped over by storms. I had asked them several times why they didn't take care of the road, but they simply replied that they weren't interested in paying out huge amounts of money for some company to come over and repave the entire road and replace every single streetlight. Since it was already completely dark, the only thing illuminating the road was the small single front light on my moped. After about 10 minutes on the road, I was about 5 or so minutes away from the main road, so it was still pitch black. Nothing was out of the ordinary until I saw movement in the corner of my eye. 
I saw a figure running from the pitch black forest and falling down on its face in the middle of the road, in front of me, with branches and leaves flying all around it. I slammed the brakes and luckily avoided hitting the figure. The back brake locked up, so I ended up falling over and sliding along the road for a bit. When I finally stopped, I quickly stood up. I was okay apart from a few scratches and looked to where the figure was laying at. Of course, I thought that it was an animal like a moose or a deer, but I quickly realized that it wasn't an animal. It was an adult human, pretty surely a man. At this point, he stood up and we were about three meters from each other, just staring at one another. I've never been more scared in my life. Even more disturbing was that this man seemed to be more scared of me than I was of him. This man was about 20 to 30 years old, quite short and very thin. His face was pale and his eyes were deep in his sockets. If you know what a badly malnourished person's face looks like, you know what his face looked like. He was wearing a dirty turquoise hoodie and basketball shorts, despite it being less than 5 degrees Celsius outside. He had unkempt blonde hair full of debris and leaves and had no shoes on, only soaking wet socks. At this point, he was constantly shaking, jolting and glaring to the direction he came out of with a worried expression on his face, like he was being chased or he knew that something bad was in that forest. I wanted to say something to him, but I was unable to say anything. After a short while, he looked straight to me and opened his mouth. It was like he was about to say something, but he quickly backpedaled, closed his mouth, and suddenly bolted to the forest without a flashlight or any other source of light and quickly disappeared. I stood there for a while alone before running to my moped, lifting it up and driving as fast as I could to the main road. My moped had quite a few big dents, a broken front mask, and a damaged exhaust, but it was still drivable. I drove home and woke up my parents to explain everything while I was still shivering from shock. They obviously were furious that I had crashed my moped and didn't believe what happened. They thought I was just being a jackass and doing stunts until I fell over. I didn't get grounded, but they didn't let me drive at night anymore. It was alright with me since I didn't want to do that either. For the entirety of the following week, I asked anyone who was in the party or was living nearby if they had seen anything unusual. I also followed the news to find out if there was something bad that happened nearby on that night, or if there was an escaped convict or a mental hospital patient loose. Nothing showed up and nobody else saw anything. I still sometimes think who that guy was and what he was doing in the forest without a light in the middle of the night. I actually feel quite bad for the guy and I feel bad that I didn't help him then because it seemed like he was not okay. Was he just drunk or high in the middle of a bad drug trip or some sort of psychosis? Maybe he was being abused, was a part of some cult or something, or someone was really chasing him through the forest. I really wished I knew. As of late, I've been racking my brain for let's not meet encounters, and while I have a ton, none of them really seemed right, until I remembered this one. Now, bear with me. It has been a while since this memory came up. My story takes place in Florida. I was 12 to 13 years of age. At the time, I was struggling with some family issues and school bullies, so I was in and out of school and my mother and I were discussing putting me in homeschool. My aunt suggested a way to help me make friends and keep me in school. Girl Scouts. You read that right. Send me to the group of little girls that sell the cookies that make the whole United States fat and their mouths water 
at just the thought of the cookies. So I agreed because I was very desperate for friends. When I say that, I mean I talked to stuffed toys and then made up voices for them so I didn't feel alone. Sad, yes, I know, but it's the truth. It is also very important because I want you all to know where my head was at with all of what you are about to listen to. I ended up going to my first troop meeting a week after the choice had been made, and I was super excited. Sadly, it wasn't what I thought it would be. The girls there, although nice, were a bit hard for me to get close to. It was a small troop of about five to eight girls, and they certainly ran in different social circles than I. Their parents were also way more gun-ho about this whole scout thing than my mother expected. They wanted this to be a stepping stone to their daughter's huge careers in college classes, etc. Anyway, after being part of the troop for two to four months, it didn't go so well. The girls shunned me, and I grew even more lonely. I even decided to approach a girl, asking her why she didn't like me. She had no problem telling me. So my mother withdrew me. Another two to three months later, another troop showed up in our area, and my mother decided we'd give it another go. After all, not all girl troops are like that. People are different, and she was certain someone would want to be friends with me. She was right, really. I did end up making friends. Not the entire troop was in love with me, but the troop leader's daughter and I had become the best of friends. Of course, my mother was thrilled. I finally had a friend and was starting to smile again. It hurts parents quite a bit to see their kids upset. Her and I did everything together. We didn't go to the same school, but that didn't matter, because we'd have sleepovers every weekend. I'd go to her house every other day after school and do homework. She had parties. Lots of them. Anytime her mother thought her daughter had something to celebrate, she threw a big party for her. And being her daughter's best friend, I was always seated right beside her. It was one of the happiest times of my life. I felt important to someone other than my family, and I had a place to go outside my home where troubles always seemed to lurk. One year turned into the second. We finished Christmas. She actually came to my birthday party, got me a gift and everything. Then things started to get weird. Because I was a year older than her, I had a bit more homework being that I also was a grade level ahead of her. She had apparently convinced her mother to change her schools. So now she was attending mine. This was great. I once again was over the moon. Only sad thing was we didn't have the same classes or the same lunch period. Well, that soon changed too. She showed up once for my lunch and I thought it was weird. Apparently, her mother had pulled some strings, got her into lunch during my time. Don't know the details, just know my best friend and I could eat lunch together. I remember telling my mom and she didn't let on that anything was the matter. But later when we talked about this, after I'd grown up a bit more. She admitted the news concerned her. Then, though, she just acted like it was the best news ever because I was happy. I decided to go fishing with her and her uncle during the summer. Spent weeks over at her home with her mother and her uncle. I'll admit the uncle was a bit different. I mean, he didn't set off any alarms, but he wasn't your usual uncle. As far as our Girl Scout troops went, we became the leaders. We pushed our troops into camping trips and selling cookies more and more. It was great. I'd never been so highly regarded. The girls in the troop even began treating me like one of them. I was happy. I fit in. That ended up changing. Quite a lot, actually. Towards the end of summer, I discovered her uncle wasn't really her uncle, more of a guy trying very hard to make her happy so he could bang her mom. He eventually stopped coming around and her mother, I noticed, drank 
a lot. More than I'd seen any adult drink at the time. The end of summer meant our last trip was coming up. The last camping trip we would get before classes started up again. I was excited to go. My mom and I bought everything we thought I would need, and my best friend and I jumped right into the van. I waved goodbye to my mom, and away my troop went. Now, it is important to admit here that I had a love of horror stories. I love spooky stuff and the occult, so the idea of a camping trip meant campfires and scary night stories. I was excited. Once we got to the campgrounds, I realized it wasn't going to be like camping with my family. It was a huge gathering of other troops all together. Older scouts, younger scouts, and us. Of course, the older scouts told us that there were some creepy gnome or troll-like creatures near the lake, but none of us believed them. It was a fun weekend, just not the same kind of fun I was expecting. I never got to tell my stories, and it was more about building teamwork and Girl Scout stuff than I thought it would be. I know, I know. What did I expect, right? You live, you learn. Anyway, the last night I decided I would tell a ghost story. I insisted on it. So, after the troop leaders went to bed, my friend and I gathered all of our troop into one tent as we'd been separated into two. And the stories began. We each told a scary story, or a funny embarrassing one, and then I was the last to tell a tale. I told my story, scared the other girls, and we hurried back to our respective tents before daybreak. Then we all packed up and got into our rides home. Everything was fine till the next meetup for my troop a week later. My mother and I showed up, and there are the adults looking very angry. Mothers, fathers, none looked happy. My friend's mother stepped up to my mom and pulled us aside. This is what I remember from that conversation. Troop leader. Miss Beeper, little Beeper isn't welcome in the troop anymore. My mom. What? Why? What happened? Well, it seems Beeper told a story at camp, and it has given some of the other girls nightmares. The other adults requested she no longer come to troop meetings. What? Are you serious? It was just a story. You can't... She, she didn't know. She loves this group. This is where her friends are. Why didn't you tell me this earlier this week when I was dropping her off at your house? The troop leader shrugged and sighed. I, at this point, took off running away from my mother and my friend's mother. I wanted to talk to my friend, to the other girls of the troop. I was going to apologize to them and their parents. Found my friend. She didn't seem heartbroken in any way. In fact, she was okay with it. I never liked sharing you with them anyway. They were stuck up and snobby and they just didn't get you. I get you. We are like sisters, so now you and I can be together more. What? But I like the other girls and being in the troop. And what about when the troop meetings happen? So are you asking me to quit the troop? I will. I'll make my mom quit too. No more troop. No, 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 no. That isn't Beeper. We are best friends. Best friends forever, remember? Anyone who doesn't like you isn't a good person, and I don't like them. It was the sweetest and nicest thing I heard from anyone. She was so into being my best friend that she'd give up this entire group. I broke down in tears. I was happy. I was sad. It was a little and a lot at the same time to take in. Sure enough, the troop would be disbanded after this. It would be a month, but eventually it can no longer be carried on. Her and I remained friends, though. I continued hanging out with her at her house. Another uncle came into the picture. That Christmas I spent at her house. Christmas night, her mother and the uncle let us, a couple 13 to 14-year-olds, take a full flute of champagne. 
I wasn't fond of it, but we felt so adult-like. The uncle kept making some rather inappropriate comments about my friend and I. Her mother became annoyed at him. They fought, he left. The next morning was hazy at best, but I remember finding my best friend in my sleeping bag with me. It didn't weird me out. We did that sometimes, crashed in each other's beds. The next week, she called me any time I wasn't with her. Our friendship became much more... Uh, creepy. The calls were every hour that I wasn't with her. She said a lot of I love yous and you were mine, my best friend, mine. I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was normal. Her mother drank more. My mother became concerned. She had every right to be. Our sleepovers got weirder. I was waking up to always having my friend in my sleeping bag. If she wasn't there, she begged me the night before to lay in her bed with her. I just thought, you know, her life at home was as rough as mine. It was what drew us together. Then one day, she admitted she liked me in that I like, like you way. I was speechless, and because I felt I was way too young for a relationship or anything, that I thought came with it. I bowed out. I told her I cared for her as a friend. We could still be friends, but that I wasn't ready for that to change. She said she understood. Went a week without calling me. I thought I'd hurt her. Even thought about calling her up and saying I loved her too. If that was what it took for us to be friends again. I didn't though. I was scared to. At the end of the week, I get a call from her, and she's acting like nothing happened. We started hanging out again, though she kept bringing up that she felt something for me. It got to a point where she was even attempting to try physically, helping me to love her. Yeah, I ended up noping it out of that friendship. One day, I just had had enough, and I told her that we couldn't be friends anymore. She seemed to handle it okay. I mean, she cried a bit. I cried a bit. I felt so heartbroken. I was in eighth grade now, and I honestly didn't like where we were at with all of this. And since I'd be going to a new school, I thought a clean slate would help. Some things happened to my household family-wise, and I ended up being homeschooled instead. Weeks after school started, and I hadn't heard anything from the girl, I got a note in my mailbox. There were notes every day in my mailbox now. Love letters, angry letters, sad ones. All from my ex-friend. Then her mother began leaving letters. Not for my mom, but for me. Both of them would leave letters in the box. The ex-friend always had them buried by the mothers were pretty clear. I'd hurt her daughter and she wasn't happy. Then phone calls started. As cliche as it was, the phone would be answered and all we'd hear is breathing. Then, they'd hang up. This carried on for six months. After three months, the letter stopped and it was just the phone calls. We had so much going on family-wise, this harassment was fairly tame and so we never dealt with it. After six months, it all stopped. Didn't hear from the girl or her mother again. They still lived in the same city. My mom still saw her mom around town and stuff, but they never spoke to us. Fast forward two to three years, and I ran into my ex-best friend again. We were at the library. I was polite. She was polite. It was pretty chill, and it sounded like her life was good. After that meeting, though, the calls started again. They carried on for about a month, then stopped. Never saw or heard from the girl again. I've since moved away and everything. The only reason this memory came up was because I was on the phone with my mother the other day. She said she saw the girl, said she looked pretty rough. I felt bad, but not at the same time. So, to the ex-best friend and her stalker mother, I hope I never run into you again.
Just to be clear, I don't seek help. It's just a collection of stories that happened throughout my life. Most of the stories coming while growing up on a very, very old farm. And I want to mention, we never felt unwanted or unwelcome or anything like that. When it happened on the farm, it was weird, sometimes scary when it happened. But afterwards, most of the time, it was okay. Most of the time. I will give you a little bit of a backstory so that you guys have a better idea how it works around here. I live in the Netherlands, in a village really close to the German border. Three kilometers or 1.9 miles. My family is really big, and most of them from my dad's side are all farmers and butchers. We grew up on a farm as well, even when my dad had his own butcher shop. The farm that my dad owned has been in my family almost 160 years and had a lot of bad things happened in its long past. Like in the 1920s, two people who worked as helpers on the farm got in a fist fight and one killed the other guy. We have the start of a really big bog on our property and throughout living there, family members, as far as I know all children, drowned there in the early 1900s. During World War II, my family helped a lot of people through the same bog because it's really dangerous if you don't know the way. A lot of German soldiers, as well as normal Dutch people, drowned there. The Germans found out we were helping them and executed my granddad's dad and a couple of his brothers to make an example. A lot of stable fires, though. It's times you cannot explain, etc., etc. So, like I said, a lot of things. I'm going to tell the stories in chronological order. Story number one. When me and one of my sisters were younger, at that time of the year, my dad had next to the house a big field with Christmas trees for selling. So it was, for six-year-old me, the perfect hiding place for hide-and-seek, because it's a maze of trees. My older cousin, 17 at the time, was searching for us, and me and my sister were trying to hide. So we went naturally in the field with the Christmas trees. After what, for a small child, is an eternity, we gave up and went looking for my cousin. Me and my sister thought we saw him through a window in one of the very old stables looking out at us. So me and my sister run towards the stable with the only entrance and exit in our sights all the time when we run towards it. Surprisingly, there was nobody there. At that moment, our cousin came from behind the main house that was behind us, by the way. So he could never have been there. And at the time, we were the only three on the farm because he was babysitting us. We asked him if he was just in the stable. He said no. So yeah, weird. Story number two. I was eight at the time and already had six brothers and sisters, me being the oldest. So we had to room up. Me, my sister below me, and the brother below my sister had to room up in the attic. Throughout growing up there, we always felt, when we were trying to sleep, that our toes were being pinched. At first, we always thought it was one of us just goofing around. It was not. When I was younger, I had sleep paralysis a lot, and at the time, of course, I did not know what it was. Only that it was scary. I realized later what it was, because it happened always in the same scary Sesame Street dream. I had that dream so many times while growing up that when I had that dream, I realized I was in a dream and somehow woke myself up, but was sleep paralyzed. Why am I telling this? Because one of those times it was different. I did not have that dream. I just woke up in a really awkward, turned-around-backwards-painfully way. A feeling of a very cold hand smushed my head into my pillow. It was very hard to breathe. Luckily for me, my sister woke up to go to the toilet, and when she hit the light, she screamed because I was laying so weird. My sister and brother ran to my dad. When my dad came up, whatever it was, the moment the door opened... I could move. 
And I know people in the comment section are going to say it was still sleep paralysis, but I knew the difference. This was very and way different. Like the cold hand, which I never felt before. Like it started with or without that scary Sesame Street dream. What it normally always does, but that's what I think. Story number three. This happened when I was 11. It was snowing very hard the night before. I was helping my dad around the farm. Nobody went to the old stables, but there was a track of footprints going out of the stables. No track at all going towards the stables, just only going out. Nobody went near the stables at that time because, like I said, you would have seen it in the snow, and it was snowing heavily the night before. My dad and my mom found this so weird that my dad went to follow the tracks with me because the tracks were leading over a field towards the bog. I was very excited because me and my brothers and sisters are forbidden to go in there because it's very and really dangerous. We disobeyed my dad once and went in there and my sister got stuck. She was chest deep in it and I was holding her so she would not go in deeper. My brother ran to my dad. Everything was okay, but we got such a hard ass whooping that had left such a big impression in our youth minds that nobody was even thinking of crossing the old man again for fear of his wrath. We followed it deep into the bog, and it led towards frozen water. Like, just frozen enough to maybe hold a small animal. Definitely not a grown man or even a toddler. I don't know if spirits can leave tracks, but we don't know what it was. If there was a track towards the old stables and a track out, it would have made more sense. But it did not. My dad was pretty spooked by this. Story number four. I was 13. We were playing Mario Kart 64 on the Nintendo 64. My dad and my mom went to my dad's weekly game of billards with his friends in the pub. We were old enough that we did not need a babysitter. Me and my sister below me were the babysitters. There was only one rule. Never open the front door or back door for anybody, even when they are knocking. Even if they are someone you know, don't open it. Just talk through the mailbox in the door. And when there was a problem, we had the phone number of the pub. This was before mobile phones were big. We were playing with four controllers, and we switched regularly, so everybody was playing. And everybody in the living room was focused so hard on the TV screen. It was like watching the World Cup, football, and soccer finals. I was on a very epic losing streak. And in the corner of my eyes, I saw a big black thing moving from left to right through the kitchen. I was so focused on getting at least one victory to get my brothers off my back. I did not look, only at the screen. When my sister said, Who all saw that black thing in the kitchen? From the eight children there, five saw it, including me. Little old me did not want to call dad and fuck up and lose my babysitting privileges. Because it's awesome when you've got the house parent-free as a 13-year-old snotling. So me and my two brothers sucked it up, got up, and searched everything. Under the beds, in the closet, bathroom, everything. But nothing. The windows were still shut, so we waited until dad came home and he was angry that we were not in bed. So we told him what happened. He said nothing much and put us to bed. That was a very scary night trying to sleep, and most important, I did not lose my babysitting privileges. Story number five. This is not as much of a story because it happened so many times while growing up there to mention them all. And as far as I know, my dad says it's still happening. And it happened when he was little as well. He also grew up on that farm. In the middle of the night, a very loud knock on the front door happened. Like one knock. Not every night, but maybe it is more than we knew because it's always just one knock. And it happens at different times. You need to already be awake, otherwise you will not hear it. 
It is not the old house making noises. I know every sound this house makes. It is a knock. One knock on the front door. Same goes for the feeling of being watched a lot, like there is something behind you. But weirdly not in the house, always in the stables or barn. And I think I have seen that person from story number one more times in that stable out of the corner of my eye. And they say animals can sense things. I think that's partially true. Like our farm dogs, they don't care. They go anywhere on the farm. We have four horses in that stable, and they're never even spooked. Only the cats act weird, like they go in and terrorize the mice in there. But sometimes they will not go in, even when you pick them up and walk in. They are very weirdly meowing and making weird sounds than they normally make. Like they are uncomfortable, or maybe they don't like me at that moment but I don't think it's that. Like growing up with a lot of children, those cats are the easiest going friendly animals out there. They will allow you to do anything with them. Story number six. In our village, there is an old textile factory in the middle of our village that's now closed, 1890 to 1978. Back then, it was a ruin. Now it's rebuilt into luxurious apartments. It's four stories high. Back then, it was a very scary building, and of course, filled with scary stories. I was 17 years old. It was a Saturday night, and me and my two friends came from the pub. Yes, back then, the legal drinking age was 16. They bumped it up to 18 a couple years ago. So, we had the brilliant idea to test our bravery and go into the factory. This was forbidden, and the factory was fenced off. But that did not stop us. We climbed the fence and entered the factory. Mind you, we did not have proper cell phones like now, with our flashlights and all that. We made our way in, almost total darkness. I know it was a stupid and dangerous move. When we were on the third floor, after walking in a good couple of feet, our hearts dropped. We could hear something moving, very slowly. And when we stopped... It stopped as well. So we sprinted as fast and as good as we could manage in the dark towards the exit. We were all freaking out. I think the alcohol has a lot to do with it as well. My friends were like, Oh my God, is this shit real? At the same time, we saw in the distance four younger teenagers running. My friend ran after them, and we followed my friend. We stopped the four boys and were like, were you guys just in that factory? At first, they were scared of us, of course. Like three older guys in hot pursuit of four younger guys? Come on. But when they said that they were, we were so relieved. We spooked each other, basically. I know it's not a ghost story, but for a second, we thought it was. And it's still a good story to tell. A couple of days later... I went in alone during the daytime just to see how it looks. I discovered then that we were very lucky because on the third floor, the middle part has collapsed on all the floors and if you drop, you drop three stories down. So yeah, we were very lucky we stopped walking. Story number seven. This happened when I was 25. One of my sisters moved into a new house. It was very secluded. Like, there are only two houses there, and a party center, which was closed during the week. Only on the weekends, it was open, so it's pretty quiet overall. After one month, I could see that something was bothering my sister. So I asked, and she did not want to say it, because it sounded stupid. But in the end, she told me. She says, sometimes at night, you could hear what sounds like a little girl softly crying at the front of her house and it was freaking her out. Because when she looked, there was nothing there, and it stopped when you opened the front door. So she asked me to sleep over so I could hear it as well, and I agreed. On the first night, nothing. But on the second night, I could hear it, and it was all like she said, like a little child is softly crying, like very softly. I looked, and nothing was there, I stayed for a third night, and it happened again. 
and now my sister starts crying, like she finally found her own place that she liked, and then this shit happens. Seeing my sister cry, I got annoyed at whatever was making the sound. So I opened the door and yelled, Can you fuck off? Leave us alone. You are not welcome here. And believe it or not, since then, it has stopped. So I don't know what I exactly did or what it was, but my sister is still living there to this day and had no more problems. Story number eight. This is my last story. Me and one of my sisters planned a movie night together. I got a key to her house. She was not there, so I let myself in. I overlooked a text on my phone that she will be a bit later because something happened at the hospital. She's a nurse, by the way. So at one point, I got bored and started to play with her dog, taking pictures, etc. And the next day, I noticed something. In the background of me taking a picture of my sister's dog, there is a face I have never seen before that's right in the background above the dog's nose. I'm going to give already some answers from my previous post about this picture. No, it's not my reflection. My face is much bigger, and I have a full-grown beard at that time, and still have. In that room, there are no posters, paintings, or TV screen, or anything with a reflective surface in that direction. No, I do not have the original anymore. Only that one, because I have a new PC. We are months down the road since I took that picture, but it is the same quality as it was on my old PC. And no, it's not the same sister house as in story number seven. Oh, here's an edit to my story. People have been asking what my scary dream was about, so here you go. I'm at a party in a garden. All of the Sesame Street people are there. At one point, I need to go inside the house, and when I try to go out, the door's locked and nobody hears me. At that point, random notes are left with chores on them. But the weird thing is, they are drawings, like clean the toilet, and after I finished it, the next note was there. This goes on for a while, and I do them all, while at the same time, I am scared and feeling that someone is watching me. The last thing I always need to do is clean the kitchen. And when finished, I go to the living room and Cookie Monster reveals himself. That's now everything, and it's all nice and clean. Then he can go kill me, because his secret recipe for his cookies are children's bones. Then he attacks me and kills me. Then I wake up, like a normal wake up, without the sleep paralysis. Later, when I had that dream so many times, when I enter the house and sing the first note, I am realizing that I am dreaming and somehow woke myself up, and then the sleep paralysis starts, with the exception of that one time. Usually, when you hear of black-eyed children knocking on people's doors, it's some schmo living on a farm in the middle of nowhere. But this was not the case. I live in the suburbs, with neighbors all around and cars driving by at all hours of the night. And though I believe in the paranormal, I never thought I would have the encounter I had. It happened earlier this year, around Thanksgiving. Like any holiday, there were lots of neighbors hosting parties with their families and random kids running around and playing outside, which I guess is one of the reasons I was as foolish as I was that day. The sun was just going down, and I was home alone watching TV and eating some turkey, and that's when I heard a knock. I looked at the clock, and it was almost 7.30, thinking it was one of the neighbors. I swung the door open without even looking, and there stood two kids. One of them was a little boy with a baseball cap on, blue jeans, and a jersey. The other one was younger and shorter, but with no cap and looking towards the floor. I looked at them and asked if they needed anything, and the older boy chirped. Yes, we just need to come in to get our baseball from your yard. As soon as he said that, a chill went down my spine, and I had a horrible feeling that I should not let these boys in. 
I looked at him, studying his face, and in the back of my head, I knew something was wrong with him, but I just couldn't place it. He must have noticed my hesitation because he exclaimed, Come on, ma'am, we just want our ball back. And that's when I realized this child had no white in his eyes. I was kind of shocked and flabbergasted. At first, I thought they were black contact lenses. I looked over at his brother, and I noticed he had the same eyes. My face must have given it away because as soon as I looked back to the leader, his eyes filled with hatred, and his cool smile turned into an evil smirk, and I swear he stood taller and more confident, staring into my eyes, and that smile that hinted, he knew what I was thinking. At that moment, the atmosphere changed from what I perceived at the beginning of the encounter as two normal and innocent boys standing in front of me, wanting their ball back, to two inhuman beings wanting to invade my home and create havoc onto my life. I just stared at him as he smirked. The smaller boy stood firmly and confidently on two feet, and he too got taller, and he also stared. After about 30 seconds of staring, the small boy broke the silence. Come on, ma'am, just let us in. And the way he said it, I could tell something changed within him. Because he spoke with such conviction in his voice, I stared at him and he smirked, all knowingly, and I didn't know what to say. In my head, I wanted to scream and call them out, tell them they were demons from another world and to get off my porch. But at the same time, I began to wonder about my safety. If I did that, it could only be worse for me. I mean, what if instead of just asking to come in, they forced their way into my house and my life? What if they got violent? I thought to myself, this charade we're playing by pretending this isn't what this is. If I don't play this game anymore, it could only be detrimental to my own health and well-being. I made the decision to keep playing along, and I looked at the smaller of the two beings and said, Yeah, I'll get it for you, and grabbed the door and slammed it in their face and began walking. I turned on all the lights and sat on my couch with my feet pulled up to my chin, and I began to shake and rock back and forth and listen. But I heard nothing. No laughter outside. No children playing. No shuffling at my door. The world fell at a standstill as I sat there silently in a fetal position. And then I heard a slow knock at my door. I immediately stopped rocking and stood still, listening intently as another knock fell upon the door. I didn't know what to do. I stared at the door and listened as another knock came through it. I refused to get up, my body so stiff and my arms so tightly wrapped around my legs, I could feel the veins in my arms pumping the blood. And the slow knocks continued for at least two minutes, followed by silence, so ear-piercing, I wondered if I lost my hearing. The entire night went by, and I sat in my living room, not knowing what to do. I don't know when I dozed off, but I woke up at around 2 a.m., and the lights were off in my house. The TV screen that was once on Comedy Central now filled with black and white static. I don't know how, but something was inside my home. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to Goodbye 2023 Part 2. I will be finishing the other two hours and getting that published as soon as possible. I'd like to take a moment and give a shout out to the reformed members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Inner Scare Wifey, Les Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty Sneese. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon.
Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.